Hi, I'm Ariel. You're watching She Wants the Diction, and today I'm going to be talking about my top three fiction books of 2020. <laughs> Admittedly, I have not read as much fiction this year as I have in years past, and I've kind of talked several times this year about how I've been reading a lot of nonfiction and just really wanted to get educated and just further myself further educate myself on what's happening in the real world. And as a result of that, the fiction, which is usually like the majority of what I read has kind of like fallen to the wayside, but I was still able to pick out a top three from the books that I read this year. And none of these were published during 2020. They were all published relatively recently. So this is not books from 2020. It's just my top three of the books that I read in 2020. So let's just go ahead and get started. Number one on the list is gonna be Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reed which I really don't think that this book needs any introduction. Like it is so popular that pretty much everyone knows what it is. And you know, if you haven't at least heard of it, I would be very, very surprised. I think that this book is actually very, very deserving of all the attention and praise that it's gotten. It is very, very much a book for our times, which I feel like is why I loved it so much. If you don't know, basic kind of summary of what happens in this book is it's about Emira who is a black millennial, and I hate to use the word millennial because I hate that we, for some reason, need to classify people by generations, but anyway, she's somebody kind of around my age group that is working as kind of a babysitter nanny for this rich white woman whose primary job is an influencer. So she is called in very, very late one night while she's at a friend's birthday party to come and take the child out of the house um, because there's like some shit going down and so they're in this this very fancy like grocery store and she's with this white child right and the security guard at the grocery store basically accuses her of you know having kidnapped the child and so there's a bystander that films all of this and the whole story is kind of her dealing with like the fallout of this incident uh racist incident and then um dealing with not only her white employer but also like her white boyfriend and I just thought it was great. Like it, it was incredibly timely. Like the characters were interesting, you know, like I, I was very invested into it and I listened to the audiobook and I finished it pretty fast, like within a couple days. The reason that I think this book is so great is because everyone recognizes like forms of racism that are very, very just like obvious, like, you know, saying the N word is a no, you know, like Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan, you know, that's a no, like, very like confederate flag you know like plastering trump all over everything like everyone very obviously recognizes the harms of those types of racism but i think something that's more insidious is like the opposite side of that where it's like white wokeness where like you're trying so hard to be progressive that you end up like fetishizing black people and sort of tokenizing them it's, it's also very harmful like the liberal side is also like very racist and very harmful, but I feel like that's not discussed as much as like, you know, very obvious forms of racism that most people would classify like as extreme. And so that's why I think the book is, is so great because it kind of satirizes, I guess, like the pursuit of white wokeness. And I thought, I just thought it was, it was so great. Like it was so real. And the fact that both, you know, her white employer and her white boyfriend, like, sort of wanted to make decisions for her and thought that they knew what was best for her instead of giving her like personal autonomy or thinking that she was like, you know, grown enough or capable enough to make her own decisions in life. Um, they kind of both wanted to impose their will onto her, uh, which is really, really fucked up obviously. And so that's like a very like subtle type of harm. Like it's harder to recognize that type of harm, but it's still also like very harmful to like project you know, what you want someone to be like onto them. And so I just think it, it just opens up like a great discussion of like liberal white wokeness. And I love that because you kind of deal with that as well. Like there are the people who are obviously racist, but then there are the people who like think they're good people, but they're still racist. You know, the type of people that would say, you know, I don't see color or, <laughs> you know, we're all the same human race and, you know, shit like that. I have a black friend, you know, I have black in my family or some goddamn shit like that. Like it was great because that book was like, it was very much about her having to interact with and navigate with these types of people. And I also said this, you know, when I was kind of discussing, you know, why I don't like horror on Instagram and what people of color are afraid of can often be 
very different than what white people are afraid of. And also, you know, in a lot of horror stories, it's like the racialized other or, you know, the dark other is what is what is scary. I feel like for a person of color, reading this is really a, I mean, like I was entertained and everything, but I think you could also read this book as horror, like kind of in a similar genre as to Get Out, like the movie, just because I feel like, you know, the racial realities like in America and shit right now are like, that is horrifying. Like that is already a horror story. Like it's, it's like, why would you want to scare yourself even more? Like reality is horrifying enough is kind of like my outlook to horror and also like, you know, having anxiety. Why would I want to read like just scary bloody shit? But the whole thing with such a fun age is that it's like you want so badly as like another person of color to be able to protect Amira and warn her, especially when her employer starts like looking at her phone and like spying on her and definitely like crossing boundaries and almost like stalking her and becoming obsessed with her. Like you want to warn her and it's kind of painful because like you can't do that. Like you have no way of like influencing the narrative. So you just kind of have to like watch as all this terrible shit happens to her and like goes down. It's difficult, it's kind of difficult to read I don't know, you know, how white people really feel reading this, but I know how I felt and it was like, I wanted to protect her so bad. So in that way, I think that it could kind of read as a horror story. I will say the one thing about this, I didn't really like the ending. Like I thought it needed a better ending, just like with a punch to it. I don't, I don't want to give anything away, but I just thought that the ending definitely could have been stronger. And apparently the genre of this is like coming of age or like, I feel like I would classify it as like contemporary because it's very much stuff that could happen and easily could happen. You see these types of stories all the time about like racist incidents and stuff. So I feel like it's the type of thing that easily could happen. And that's why I liked it so much. Like it's, it's fictional, but it, it definitely like could apply to our present times. And so I loved this. This is one that I actually bought people for Christmas and I think it can start a lot of like great conversations and it was really engaging as well as being something that's addressing like issues that are that are happening right now. So that one was published in 2019 but I actually read it this October. My second favorite book of the year is gonna have to be The People in the Trees. This is by Hanya Yanagihara and I absolutely loved this. This was published in 2013, but I actually read it this April. And the reason being is that I kept seeing A Little Life everywhere. And when I went and looked at like her other book, I really liked the cover for this one. Like it was kind of like, just like creepy nature type thing. And it's really hard for me to say that I would recommend this book because I really wouldn't recommend this book to a lot of people. And I kind of realized that while I was doing like my, my Christmas book shopping, I was like, I didn't end up getting anyone this book just because I feel like not a lot of people would like this book. And that's basically because it's about a child molester, like straight up, <laughs> that's what it is. She based this book around a real life Nobel prize winning scientist who was later discovered to be a child molester. And so she kind of wrote a fictionalized, story about one and from the perspective of one and you might say to yourself well if you've seen any of my recent videos i dnf'd earthlings by sayaka murata because it was about a child who was being sexually abused and you might say well how are you going to dnf something like that and then turn around and say you know you read this book from the perspective of someone who's doing the abusing and what i would say to that is i feel like this book is not just for shock value. Like it would be very easy to write something like this just for shock value. But the way that it is framed, I feel like it is making a deeper commentary on our fascination with true crime and killers. And the way that this book is set up is it kind of starts off with like a news story explaining, you know, what this Nobel Prize winning scientist was accused of doing. Then you kind of get his perspective. It starts off with his life and account of his life. And the whole thing is kind of like, well, how did we get from, you know, prestigious scientist to child molester? Like, how does this happen? How did this happen? How can someone presumably who did so much good become so evil? And it was just kind of this whole, I feel like commentary on the fascination with killers and, you know, true crime stories, because it's like, you want to know how this transition happened, 
why, what happened, like what were the circumstances that led to this happening? How could you possibly ever do that to someone? And the whole thing I feel like is sort of roasting our obsession with, you know, for example, serial killers. I've talked before about how I like, you know, reading about serial killers and, and there are people who are like, love true crime. And it's like, well, why are we so invested into other people's pain? You know, and I feel like this book is sort of a deeper commentary on that. Like, why do you want to know? And why are we so morbidly curious about these types of things? And so this book is amazing, not only because I feel like it's, it's very well written. She very much gets into the head and the mindset of this character. And, and it's also like, it's very haunting, I would say, because the price that you pay for finding out, you know, how he became this person is a high one because this book is, the final scene is just like unforgettable to me. It really answers the question of how could you be so terrible? Like, what are these people thinking? Like, it's so impressive that she's able to get into such a twisted mindset to be able to write from his perspective, to be able to write like this and make him a character that I personally thought was like, was like relatable, like was empathetic. Like, and I know a lot of people, you know, were saying they didn't like him, they didn't like the narrator, he's detached, he's this, he's that. But I think I really tend to like these detached scientist characters. I mean, one of my other favorite books of all time is also about, you know, a relatively detached scientist, uh, you know, exploring the unknown. And this book was very, very similar, much darker granted. And I don't admire this main character like I do the main character of Annihilation, but yeah, it, I don't know, I tend to like those types of characters and I guess I, I relate to them and, and whatever else, but it's, it's very disturbing. And I know that because of the content, there are many, many people who will be turned off to this book, who will not be interested in this book. I loved it. I thought it was great. <laughs> and so that's why I wouldn't recommend it. And that's why I think, you know, it has a relatively low rating compared to the skill of her writing because she's writing about something that's so... Um, just divisive and sort of uh, distasteful. Not really something that a lot of people would want to read or would want to read about. And, you know, there's going to be outrage right out the gate. So I've seen this book classified as science fiction or, you know, magical realism. And I don't know, I guess it does kind of have like a sci-fi element to it in that there's uh, like an improbable aspect to the story because the discovery that he makes is kind of, it doesn't doesn't exist in real life, this would never happen. But I also think there's some pretty great themes in here about like white saviorism, colonization. Like I said, I feel like there's a lot, a lot, a lot of commentary happening as far as what the story is trying to accomplish. So beautifully written, I love the meaning. I mean, not all people will probably extrapolate the same meaning about like true crime from this as I did, but you know, I definitely felt called out by that because it's like, yeah, why are serial killers so interesting? Like, here's a bunch of primarily white men who kill, for the most part, women. And it's like, why is that so interesting? You know, like, that's it's kind of fucked up. So yes, absolutely love this book. Again, would not recommend to everyone. But for me, it was like, great. It's like, I'm there. I love everything about this. Like, I would definitely, this is one that I would definitely like reread in the future. Okay, and the final favorite book for this year is gonna have to be The First Rule of Punk. This is by Celia C. Perez, and this is a little out of the ordinary for me in that it's like a middle grade, uh, which I don't read an awful lot of, but I believe I originally saw this book on uh, Priscilla's channel at Bookie Charm. Never would have like found this or read this of my own accord if not for her recommendation, but she gave it a glowing recommendation and I loved, you know, the cover art. It's like lime green. It's very like vibrant. It has this, you know, Latina girl, very front and center. She's very energetic. And I don't know, I loved that. And it's basically about a girl named Malu. She is 12 years old. She's very, very into like punk music, punk rock. And I just thought this, this story was so great. I really like related to it on a personal level, I think, because what happens is <laughs> Uh, she's basically called a coconut in school, which is kind of a derogatory term for, you know, you might be Latina on the outside, but you're, you're white on the inside, which is kind of a very similar experience to what I went through in school, which was like, I was called an Oreo a lot. I think those type of microaggressions and stuff that is said to you um, really stays with you. Like it's something that you, you never really forget and does have a huge impact on you at an age when you don't really understand like racial dynamics. 
And so I love this story because it was about Malu embracing that she isn't, you know, one, one extreme or the other, right? Like she is a mixture of two cultures. And it was also about her kind of discovering that punk isn't just something that belongs to white people. And I feel like this is true with a lot of not only genres of music, which a lot of genres were invented by black people, but also it's like a similar thing in that culture where it's like, it's not normal to be normal to be so invested into punk. But there are a lot of people of color who are invested into different subcultures. Like there are black goths, black emos, black otakus, um, sort of subcultures that you don't see represented a lot. And, you know, when you think of a black person, you don't think of them as belonging to those subcultures. And so it's kind of sort of out of the ordinary or sort of like deemed a white interest. And so I just thought that was great because I think there, there are a lot of kids out there who feel like they don't fit into the boxes or feel like they are unusual for their culture or, you know, their race or whatever. And so this story speaks directly to that, like sort of straddling the line of, you know, two cultures and not really feeling like you're a real feel, fill in the blank, you know, like you're a real Latina or you're a real black person. And, you know, cause like you don't conform to all the stereotypes, but I feel like this book is really about transcending the binary of, you know, having to choose between one culture or the other. And I just, I love it. I love it so much. It has like these little mock zines that sort of separate the chapters that Malu is making. And another interesting aspect of this story is, so her dad sort of owns a record store and is, you know, the parent that she probably likes better, she, she gets along with better, um, that really supports her and encourages her. And then there's the mom, which she doesn't get along with as much because the mom very much has these stereotypical feminine ideas of, you know, what she wants her to be. She wants her to be like a good Mexican daughter, basically. And Malu isn't really somebody who's like wanting to do hyper femininity. Like she's, she's wanting, instead of wearing dresses, she wants to wear her jeans and her Converse and her dyer hair and, you know, all this stuff. And her mom just like does not get it because she wants her to adhere to this traditional femininity, which again is something I super relate to. <laughs> I remember being forced to wear skirts and dresses as a kid and past a certain age, I absolutely hated it. So I think this is one that I just connected to on a really, really personal level, but that could really be a lifesaver for some kid out there who just like does not understand where they fit. And to be able to tell them like, there is a place for you. There is a place you belong. Like, I mean, that's part of the reason I make this channel is to be like, if there's someone else out there that just feels like a goddamn alien, you can come here and, you know, be accepted and know that there is someone else out there. I mean, it feels like there's no one else because, you know, it, you're so isolated or there's just no one near to you, but the, those people exist. They are out there. I absolutely, I loved this book. And so could not recommend that, could not recommend that more. I read that in September and it was published in 2017. That is gonna do it for my top three books that I read this year, at least the fiction. Um, hopefully a nonfiction video is coming, but that video is going to be probably much longer and have a lot more recommendations because I read so much good nonfiction this year. Like, I can't even begin to tell you how much good nonfiction I read this year. But let me know what your top three books were of this year down in the comments, if you so wish. And thank you so much for watching. I will see you guys in my next video. Peace. Yeah,